Hello, this is uh, part three of a video series that I'm doing called The United States Has Declared War on Its Own Marginalized Population. Uh, if you'd like, um, I recommend if you guys read, uh, um, watch the last two uh, videos uh, before uh, watching this one, so that way you basically get a clear idea of what I'm going to talk about. Of what I'm going to talk about uh, in this video. Anyways, uh, thank you for uh, clicking on this video. I hope you enjoy. Considering that the emancipation of the working classes must be conquered by the working classes themselves, that the struggle for the emancipation of the working classes means not a struggle for class privileges and monopolies, but for equal rights and duties and the abolition of all class rule. The economical subjugation of men of labor to, monopoli to, uh, to the monopolizer of the means of labor that is the source of life lies at the bottom of servitude in all its forms and the class misery, the mental degradation, and political dependence. That the economical emancipation of the working classes is therefore the great end on which every political movement ought to be, ought to be subordinate uh, as a means. That all efforts aiming to the great Hithro failed from the want of the solidarity between the manifold divisions of labor in each country, from the absence of the fraternal bond of union between the working classes of different countries. That the emancipation of labor is neither a local nor a national, but a social problem, embracing all countries in which modern society exists, depending on the so on this on the solution to the concurrence practical and theoretical of these of the most advanced countries that the present revival of the working classes in the mo in the most industrious countries of europe while it raises a new hope gives a solemn warning against the relapse into the old errors and calls for the immediate combination of the still di of the still disconnected movements for these reasons the international working men's association has been founded end quote Karl Marx, General Rules. This quote from Marx highlights the essential need for the working classes and for especially transgender people, women, and and black people in the United States to be able to emancipate themselves by themselves with their own power. As was pointed out by Laura Miles in the last video that I basically made talking about this very subject itself. As we have pointed out in the first chapter, the previous movements beforehand, such as the Civil Rights Act and even the Stonewall Riot, as well as many other revolutionary movements and revolutionary situations that occurred during the revolutions of 1968, had failed due to the fact of its spontaneity, just as in France, Mexico, Algeria, Britain, and Germany, pre and, uh, and, Czech and Czechoslovakia as well in the, in, during the revolutions of 1968. Therefore, we still need to be able to organize the working class and spread classical consciousness to these workers and especially to marginalized groups that are part of the working class and their struggles and their, uh, and, and their uh, feuds with, against capitalism and against the bourgeois state of the United States of America is also intertwined with the overall class struggle against uh, capitalism as a whole. Not that it not that it essentially supersedes it or undersedes it, but that it is in a dialectical relation and a dialectical relationship between that of the identity struggle uh, against capitalism and the class struggle against capitalism. One that is intertwined and one that is something that is able to help workers themselves be able to emancipate themselves, both as workers but also as a marginalized and, and repressed population. There is no other uh, pop. There's no other population of doing this since the start of capitalism than the homosexual population, both in the United States but also around the world. Now, when I define as homosexual, I'm not merely just talking about people that are are that have sexual interests into the people of the same sex. I'm actually integrating both the both homosexual, bisexual, pansexual. Uh, and even asexual populations around the world as having the common struggle based off their sexual their their sexuality and their entire ideas uh, and their entire um, preferences uh, based off their sexuality and what they basically choose to do so that has been around for a very very long time among human society in general even in class societies but even understand what sexuality but even understand what homosexuality bisexuality etc even is we have to understand the sexuality in general Sexuality are able. Sexuality is a ability for basically species 
um, to be able to have a sexual attraction and have sexual uh, preferences with different uh, species around the world. This especially applies to humans where we have been able to have certain consciousness and have developed a huge amount of abundance of of clear consciousness to be a and self consciousness to be able to choose on who we basically want to be with and who and um, what kind of uh, people are we sexually attracted to to be able to choose to have sexual intercourse with. This can aside to people of the opposite sex, biological sex, but also people of the same sex or or both sexes entirely, or even different sexes in general, because uh, and this is has been something that's been going on since the very start of human society. In fact, it has been recorded in anthropological uh, in anthropological um, works from actually even Hen from actually uh, from actually Lewis uh, Henry Morgan that uh, that we've actually had that there, in tribalist societies such as uh, societies before slavery we've actually had we, there was actually a huge uh, acceptance of homosexuality and different forms of sexuality throughout the world. Even in slavery, such as in ancient Greece, uh, in ancient Rome, homosexual relationships were very were very common. Uh, in fact, in fact, it was in fact in some places it was kind of the norm as well, where basically homosexuals and bisexuals were able to basically be uh, considered for be able to be, just be considered as humans and be able to be considered as different forms of people. They are able to have that are different people that are basically able to have the exact same rights and have the exact same um, privileges as certain other peoples depending on their actual social class, not necessarily their sexuality or their sexual orientation. Homosexual marriages were even common in these places, although, as we also basically said before, um, marriage, especially in these points, uh, like did not for men did not essentially apply to the same characteristic as what women had in these marriages, in these marriages as well. As well as the fact that marriage, as its origins, originate as a start of a way where slave, where slavery, a sexual slavery, could be introduced in a society based off sla- uh, based off based off slavery as the mode of production. But even in feudal kingdoms, such as the Kingdom of uh, Brittany and also even the Kingdom of Castile, homosexual relationships were also um, not necessarily commonplace, but were accepted uh, at the very least, and were very much and were very much uh, instituted as as actually a civil, um, as actually a civil relationship between one people towards another, and that they're able to be, and that they were able to be able to be considered humans as long as they are staying loyal to the kingdom and to their landlords as a whole. Of course, landlord families did not necessarily commit much to homosexuality or bisexuality, and rather, mostly peasants under feudalism were mostly commonplace to, to uh, commit um, to uh, homosexual bisexual relationships with, around this time. However, everything changed when capitalism, and specifically the liberal revolutions, were actually instituting itself. For the first time in history, um, many liberal historians, such as Jean Jacques, m- many liberal philosophers, uh, and even uh, different for- and di- even different forms of revolutionaries around this time, such as Jean Jacques Rousseau, um, Jean Locke, uh, Alexander Hamilton, and John Madison. Uh, were arguing that homosexuality is should not necessarily be accepted, nor should it be able to be uh, widely spread uh, around these places, uh, around the places that they are basically declaring as republics away from basically the field kingdoms. They cited it. They cited it as being antagonistic to what they call the state of nature, where the state where bas- where basically um, the the beings and the entire uh, structures of how uh, things are are basically one intertwined on man's creation and man's choice in the matter and man's own uh, natural natural uh, rights to be able to be to actually be declared by the state entirely. And that democracies and be in also forms of quote unquote republics are the are the forms of basically of uh, nature uh, for man and man's governance. They argue that homosexuality and bisexuality is is something that is is something that is un, that is antagonistic to the state of nature, and something that would actually prove that would prove uh, to be um, antagonistic and also dangerous and kind of revolutionary to the to the uh, efforts to be able to free for the peasants to be able to free for the peasants to be free and merchants to be free from the feudal uh, from the feudal landlords. 
Thus, in, 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 in certain time periods, even before the liberal revolutions, homosexuality and bisexuality and any forms related were considered to be illegal and were to be enforced by different knights and different royal guards throughout uh, feudal kingdoms, but also liberal republics uh, during this time period. It started in 1492 uh, in Spain uh, when homosexuality and bisexuality was actually considered to be legal for the very first time in, in its history. And after after Castile were able to unite different uh, kingdoms into a kingdom into a different a kingdom known as Spain, and that was when homosexuality, uh, bisexuality, anything related was con was considered to be legal and immoral to the uh, Catholic faith. Even in Protestant countries such as Britain and the Holy and uh, and different um, kingdoms within the Holy Roman Empire were also uh, hom were also illegal, were also making homosexuality and bisexuality illegal, considering uh, being making it considered to basically be immoral and un unjust and unjustful towards uh, towards God and God's intentions towards humanity. This was especially the case within Russia, where uh, even before this time, homosexuality was very, very much considered to be Im immoral uh, in the first place. Uh, in fact, Ru even Russia back then even had very, very cruel uh, uh, periods and also policies towards homosexuality. Straight up, straight up gouging people's eyes out, cutting off genitalia, as well as even uh, cutting off limbs if someone was to even be suspected as a homosexual within the kingdoms of, Mus uh, of Muscovy and uh, and and Finland and Estonia within the Ru within the Russian uh, origins and the Russian kingdoms. But things would actually even get worse from here, actually. During the establishment of capitalism in the early in the early eighteen twenties and eighteen twenty in eighteen twenty one, uh, Brit Britain, France, and America and Mexico were were enforcing laws that that were able that were able to allow police officers to even be and to even be anyone that was basically considered a homosexual, as well as actively use slurs that they basically came up at the time, such as the such as faggot. Uh, queer and many other different, um, and many other different ideas and different slurs uh, about and sig and stereotypes about homosexual people and bisexual people around the time uh, that basically consider them to be inhuman and subhuman. In fact, justifying certain countries such as the Ottoman Empire uh, that were also basically uh, being pressured to basically go into capitalism due to the pressures of the world market at the time to basically commit genocides and even mass killings of homosexuals and bisexuals around this time. Especially in the Balkan areas where they too were also facing pressures and were also even facing their own liberal revolutions during 1848, during the revolutions of 1848, that basically pressured capitalism to be instated in some of these countries. So as capitalism grew and grew, more repression and actually more repression and more uh, problems actually faced towards homosexuals and bisexuals around this time and made heterosexuality the entire norm within capitalism as a whole. Which is not something to actually even be, which is actually not even something to actually be surprised of. After all, the after all, capitalism is defined based off commodity production and based off a of working class producing those commodities, in which they are able to basically be extracted their surplus value that the surplus value is produced within the actual representation of their labor power uh, in their money form that has already been sold off to their owner uh, and to their employer in the first place. And because of that, it basically relies on the huge amounts of commodity production, as in the products that we use ourselves, that we buy, and that we exchange with within the market structure of capitalism, to be produced based by workers and by uh, and by workers that are basically working for capitalists or the or the owners of prior property. Therefore, this requires actually for a this actually requires for an abundance of a working class population. So not only are they able to actually have a cheap resource for labor to produce a commodity that could be able to get them profit at a higher production rate, but also they're able to actually ensure that a working class and that a and that a uh, commodity producing class in general is able to actually have a certain significance within the capitalist mode of production so that way they could be able to keep employing so that way they can still keep on employing workers and making people commit themselves into wage slavery 
essentially ensuring just as just as slavers uh, of, of women in slavery ensuring that the breeding processes within this cap within the class mode of production of this given class society is able to actually act in the interests of the other ruling class entirely thus able to actually uh, coerce people just as just as they coerce people to go to work uh, into being a, into have into having to have children in order in order for a working class population to emerge itself and to actively uh, commit itself to wage slavery Classes, we have to understand, though, that now classes are your social relations to the means of production. The means of production is based on the ways on how things are produced, as in the mode of production. Thus, the root of what affects the world and how it and how and how is the mode of production for each given society can be altered on what on what it produces as well. Thus, if there is commodity production and exchange in a nation, that means there is a class dominance and there is an exploited proletariat uh, from a private property owning class that buys their layer power in the first place. Therefore, uh, therefore, uh, that creates a bourgeoisie in which they can control prior property and own layer power in which workers would produce commodities in the prior property they have. This applies to the working class in a specific way. The working class is exploited from the extraction of surplus value. The worker, being so dependent on the machinery around him, can still produce surplus value, which can be extracted to be used to accumulate labor. This accumulation of labor is known as capital. And the accumulation of that capital from selling commodities at, and once uh, uh, from selling commodities, and as well as the uh, maintenance of the business, uh, be, can be taken care of as the cost of production, i.e. profit is the final result of this of this process and that and what makes it profitable for this private property owning class in in this certain economic system this economic system is capitalism and this accumulation of capital and and facilitation of capital at the same time is is structured and is able to be um is able to be um as able to be facilitated and able to uh, dominate itself in a system known as capitalism because the accumulation of capital and the, and the facilitation of capital in the first place is very rampant. The value of, the, of a commodity is built off the extraction of surplus value from a workforce, no matter who is in control of the means of production. This is, this is why we have to abolish commodity production in the revolution. Capital is also a process of labor in which value is able to valorize itself into being. Because of this, capital has two functions that come down to a common denominator. Capital, capital is the accumulation of labor and how value is valorized. But at the end, the ways on how the worker is set into motion to produce commodities and how they come about is from the fact that the worker is able to produce surplus value from the labor time they perform into the workday. All of that, and everything I just described, is considered capital. Which is why capital, by function, is exploitive, because the private property owning class is using the working class uh, to their own benefit. Taking advantage of the fact of the economic depravity and also the need for the workers to be able to get a job in the first place, uh, to be able to even uh, to be able to even function in that living society in the first place. Therefore. This process of extraction of surplus value and being able to actually get profit in the first place out of the production of commodities that basically have workers do this is by function exploitive. And this is the nature of capitalism. And by doing this, this also means they, that they need a huge amount of a population as well as the fact they need a working class population in the first place to be able to have this be done as well. Thus, but at the same time, they do not necessarily need the state to be able to do this and to basically you and basically have um, breeding and have be able to have breeding mandates. Although some bourgeois states actually do have that. Rather, what they essentially want to do is by what actually what they essentially do desire to do and what they do essentially structure itself to be is that they basically economically coerce and are able to condition others to basically uh, conform itself and abide itself to the current capitalism of production through coercion and through uh, econo and through ex and through uh, financial uh, pressure uh, from the from the structures of basically using finances and money as the main structures on how we are able to pay and uh, and and buy and even sell uh, goods and services in the first place. 
This makes capitalism as an exploitive, bureaucratic, alienating, uh, and creates po- uh, as this creates uh, capitalism as an exploitive and bureaucratic and alienating system, with, and it creates poverty plus the huge amounts of problems of the self destruction of the overproduction of overproduction and self destruction and overproduction. All this is done to uh, to produce misery and codependency in the economic action and massive amounts of dangerous, violent actions. All of this is basically enforced by the state that is able to be dependent on this capitalist system in the first place. The state is dependent to the capitalist economy to be able to have taxation legitimize itself, and for there to be a constant value among money from circulation from circulating from circulating investment from the state to the medium uh, to a medium of circulation. That is why money in capitalism is usually printed by a national bank or a department of treasury owned by the bourgeois state because this money is to represent the actual wealth and even the profit that the, that the bourgeoisie is able to get that the, that the state could be able to tax from in the first place to legitimize itself and see itself as actually even further uh, itself among the actual bourgeois power and among the actual bourgeoisie in the first place and this is and this specific state structure and to be able to do this in the first place is known as the bourgeois state the state, however, it's, uh, itself isn't the bourgeoisie itself, but the state does depend on the bourgeoisie and acts in the interest for them. For the bourgeoisie are able to facilitate capital, the same accumulation of labor that the state has to use to provide services and materials to its people. They are abstracted into a sphere of privilege. Thus, when the state has to maintain its interests, uh, they do so through judicial and legislative means of violence and force. Thus, it acts as an authority of a ruling class over a non-ruling class that uses judicial and legislative means of violence and force to enforce its authority. In this case of the bourgeois state, they're able to do this um, with the police and the standing army that is made to protect private property and capital accumulation domestically and foreign um, to be able to act in the interest of private of private property owners uh, and us and labor power owners so that way they could be able to accumulate more capital worldwide and expand their profits as well. As we can see here, the problem here is the fact that the activity of capitalism is exploitive and allows monopolies to dominate our society and form and our formations today is very much going against the interests of the population that creates a division of humanity indirectly from the system itself and leads the people to still defend it because it could benefit in some of way. Free market, which basically only with, and basically alienating workers by proposing ideas that actually further the capitalist system, such as free markets or even or, or even nationalization. As an example, free markets just means further oppression against the working class, and a market entirely is oppressive against the working class because it, it basically coerces the working class uh, to be able to sell their labor power in the first place, completely, completely negating on the fact that on, on their own ability to own their own ability to work, as well as the fact uh, they have to be able to do this in order to basically get money and pro- and to only get money in order for them to actually p- buy the foods and services that they need in order to survive. This is what makes capitalism capitalism, is the fact that basically the market and commodity production and the exchange of those commodities in that format of the commodity production itself is the most generalized and the most used format of production uh, entirely within an economic system. And this is the thing that defines capitalism as capitalism and the very nature of capitalism itself, which is why capitalism by its very nature and its mode of production is exploitive. Not only is this something that is just the social reality of capitalism in our current society as a whole since the since 1821, but uh, throughout the world, but also this is something that Karl Marx himself analyzed a part his a part of his entire critique of capitalism as a whole, in a contribution to the critique of political economy by Karl Marx. Karl Marx says, quote, The concept of the national wealth finds its way into the works of the economists of the 17th century as the notion that the wealth is created for the state, whose power, on the other hand, is proportional to this wealth, a notion to which some extent still survives among the 18th century economists and is still un- unintentionally hypocritical ma- uh, unintentionally hypocritical manner in which wealth and the production of wealth are proclaimed to be a goal of the modern state, which is regarded merely as a means of for producing wealth. End quote. Karl Marx, a contribution to the critique of political economy. 
So, as we can see here, this is something that was very beneficial for capitalism to be able to do in the first place, that basically uh, was able to uh, have, ca have capitalism, have the uh, bourgeoisie of capitalism uh, coerce the working class to commit into heterosexual relationships, so that way they could coerce people to be able to uh, make babies in order to create more of a working class population, so that way there is more people that is dependent on their power. This is why abortion was even heavily uh, scrutinized and heavily enforced under capitalism and still uh, again, uh, heavily enforced against uh, in capitalism and why abortion remains legal to, uh, illegal in many countries still today, include, including, as of recently, in the United States. And even with uh, Roe v. Wade as resolution, there were states that still had abortion illegal such as Georgia, where people, where women that were able to have an abortion and were to go out of state in order to get an abortion could, uh, were able to face 10 years uh, in prison um, for, for basically trying to basically go out of the state uh, to basically get an abortion so that way they don't have to subject a child into economic, depra uh, into economic poverty uh, that is able to, that would most likely result into the child's death at, at infancy in the first place uh, even then. So because of that, um, this entire structure of basically having uh, more and more people po impoverished and having more and more people uh, face economic insecurity uh, is a way where basically they are able to uh, coerce workers into having to commit themselves into wage slavery as a way to be able to further their own power and further their own profit as well. And by having that profit and that profit being the main structures of society as a whole, it requires the state to having to basically recognize that and be able to and the, for the state to basically adapt itself to that in the first place. So that way they could be able to legitimize itself as well. Thus, this profit and this ability to be able to even uh, be able to make wealth for themselves is able to actually allow themselves to actually be have more power and have more uh, significance within within the capitalist mode of production. And this capitalist mode of production then creates the social hierarchy and the social powers that basically allows itself to come to be in the first place. Therefore, the capitalist system as a whole is the root problems on how on how uh, hierarchy and on how these things are basically able to be produced, not really the state. The state is only merely an instrument for the capitalist mode of production and for even modus of production as a whole under class societies uh, for it to basically emerge itself as well, just as classes are able to emerge itself and dependency and also in relation to the mode of production in the first place as well. Even with homosexuality legalized, and even with uh, abortion in European countries, uh, such as countries a part of the EU, are legalized, the 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 cer the, the per certain laws uh, that are able to basically repress women and repress homosexuals and bisexuals around the, around the world are still in effect today, such as public indecency laws, um, dress code dress code laws and many other formats that are able to actually be used as a way to be able to use it into a social format in which they're able to repress and also um and also jail homosexuals and women uh that are able to express themselves more freely that might be antagonistic and is antagonistic to the capitalist social order as it is that is why you even see some even liberals and even pro-capitalist politicians in general propose conversion therapy laws as well as different laws that basically would allow um, different forms of basically converting more people to heterosexuality um, as a, as a, as an effort to be able to legitimize itself both from liberal both from liberal politicians and and conservative politicians within the United States of America. Before we continue to the rest of this video, I want to be able to actually quote a uh, <clears throat> a uh, Marxist uh, that basically uh, made a good analysis on the subject and actually made actually a subject on how these reactionary ideas and these reactionary policies that emerge itself uh, both during the both during uh, the liberal revolutions uh, and even in the uh, emergence of capitalism itself can actually still come back despite of our current uh, more progressive um, policies under capitalist uh, under the capitalist mode of production uh, today. This video that I'll be quoting from and that I'll share a segment from is called Marxism and Sexuality by Noel Halifax. The other thing I want to say very quickly is that um, another 
myth around, which I want to pop, is the idea that um, backward ideas, it's just education and enlightenment, and that, you know, in the bad old days of the 50s, 60s, and the century was evil, and now with enlightened people, onward and upward, it could be better, and it's all part of backwardness. In actual fact, until you get away the basis of oppressions, it can come back very easily. Now, on a global scale, you can see that the old scapegoats since the recession have come back. It's the Roma, it's the gays in Russia, Hungary, it's, you know, in some places, it's the Jews again, actually. So, I have anti Semitism in the East and stuff. The, the classic scapegoats that we saw in the 1930s have re emerged in this century, and it's the same old cliches. But you can see it, how this, and people often compare, say, Weimar, how the Weimar had a homosexual rights movement, yes, they won certain freedoms, and then ten years later you've got Hitler and you've got fascism, or you, they often use an example of um, the Bolsheviks within a couple of months of gaining power completely liberal, they, they, they legalise homosexuality, they promote alternative to the family, they, they're most progressive, yet see even today, and then when the rise of Stalin, completely reverse, it's that of the family, homosexuality is illegal, abortion is illegal, the family, the family, the family food is the perfect Soviet way. But you can see it with, even more recently, in a, a less well-known attitude, an attitude gay liberation front, 69 was still more right. Within a year, they saw themselves as revolutionaries. Again, I'll come on to that because um, they weren't just fighting for uh, equality, they were for complete transformation of society. And they named themselves after the country at war with their country at the time, the Viet Cong. They named themselves after the Viet Cong, that was like, and gave them themselves after, I don't know, whoever America was at war with this week, um, <laughs> and with that government. Um, but secondly, they ally themselves with the Black Panthers, the Black Panthers ally themselves with them. And though his, there was a brief period of about 18 months when the most progressive bits of American society was mainstream black culture, was actually very pro-gay. Um, that which is not how people think of black culture, black music being with hip hop and the rest of it. I'm going to play a, work, a record from that period. This is by um, Smokey Robinson and the Miracles, not an obscure band at the time, and it's called There's No One Straight in LA. <laughs> I recommend everyone to watch the entire uh, session of Noel Halifax's uh, uh, session called Marxism and Sexuality by Noel Halifax. Um, she did it with the, uh, um, with the, with the um, Social Workers Party of Britain uh, at a Mar at, at Marxism twelve uh, Marxism twenty uh, twenty twelve. Um, so yeah, I recommend uh, you guys uh, were to watch that, and I would be. Um, that would definitely be, uh, good for, well, for people to basically understand more about that. So, yeah. The point of when I pointed this out and why I was, on uh, why I share this segment is the fact that basically these reactionary ideas and these stereotypes towards homosexual people, black people, uh, Jews, and many other, uh, and many other marginalized people around the world are coming back and can and have came back in certain ways in the past and are still coming back today. An example of that is this current war on the marginalized groups that the United States has declared war on um, since the past two years and it's actively uh, fighting against it. But this is not something new. In fact, this war has actually been starting and has actually been around since the very uh, essence and the very structures of capitalism itself based off the actual class struggle between the proletariat and the bourgeoisie. This is one of the main problems about capitalism and uh, capitalism as a whole is the fact that basically all this stuff and all of the entire structures and oppression that basically still continues on today within the capitalist mode of production uh, is is profitable and is reliant into the capitalist system and is able to allow the bourgeoisie to be able to get profit uh, in this entire structure in the first place. 
This is why we need to be able to protest in the streets and be able to act in a in a complete rebellious and and and, ta- and uh, rebellious and strikeful manner against the bourgeoisie and the current entire structure as a whole. Because we are actively already being attacked by the bourgeoisie because it is profitable for them to be able to destroy our freedoms and destroy our ability to organize um, because so that way they can be able to get as much money as a, and as much profit into their pockets as possible. We need to be able to rebel and say no against this and be able to stand in firm opposition against capitalism and against the entire structure of society as a whole because that is the reality at hand on how this basically com- uh, comes about. And that is the reality and the problems of, of capitalism but also class society as a whole is the fact that basically allows this oppression and is able to allow these certain kinds of uh, oppressive and repressive uh, structures to merge itself in the first place. And why and why we should be ap- actively and uh, actively opposed to it and act in firm opposition against such uh, structures of racism, homophobia, transphobia, and sexism, and ableism, and any form of identity oppression as well, as well as stand against and also stand with the class and the working class that are oppressed and repressed every day, which is the working class, and actively participate in a class war against the bourgeoisie in order to basically stop it. The best way to actively participate in the action of cl- uh, of the class war and to be able to fight against the bourgeoisie's oppression and repression against uh, against uh, the marginalized group, especially here in the United States of America, is by a- is by participating and and in- acting revolution itself. A revolution has historically changed society. A revolution itself is almost as if the proletariat declares war against the bourgeoisie altogether as a class, as a class war. In this class warfare, this is a warfare of a class between another class. Classes itself are your social relations to the means of production. This is a pure international phenomenon by function and thus gives a need for this revolution and this class war to take place as a class against another uh, against another without borders, but common respect among proletarians in, uh, in those national borders that are drawn by the bourgeois state and will become negated once more worker states are connected to each other. A revolution itself is almost as the proletariat declares war against the bourgeoisie, altogether as a class, a class war. That is the revolutionary function of the worker state entirely. The worker state itself is the class it is the revolution itself, where the working class rises up against their against, against the board, against the owning class and subjects the owning class to the will and the authority of the working class in their own legislative bodies. And that is, and that is even a the worker state is even a a shorter term of what of what is considered as the dictatorship of the proletariat, which is another word meaning the absolute rule of the working class. This absolute of rule of the working class means the entire uh, majority of society as a majority as a whole rebelling against an against against the against the minority people that are oppressing them. That being the owning class and the and the small amount of politicians and bureaucrats that are able to decide legislation over the mass majority of people that actually make up the majority of society, which includes which includes the marginalized people as a whole. That is why we have to stand together in these in these protests against the against the Roe v, uh, against the overturn of Roe v Wade and also stand in the BLM protests and stand in any other revolutionary situation that is happening in the United States or even just general activism as well so that way a revolutionary situation can at least be built up or or uh, in order to basically draw in the spontaneous movement of the working class and then draw it into a a party where this could be organized into a greater whole as Karl Marx Frederick Engels, Vladimir Lenin, Leon Trotsky, Tony Cliff, Chris Harmon, Paul Foote, Duncan Hollis, and many other Marxists in the world have all have tried to do and have uh, and have uh, done in the past as well. And we must be able to do that today because that is on how this revolution and that is on how uh, fighting back against this war that the United States has declared war against the marginalized will do.
If you want to help out on this, then I recommend you all join the International Socialist Tendency. So th it, because that is the main organization that I agree with, and that is the main organization that is honestly actually having a coherent theory and a coherent praxis with that, and a coherent practice with that theory that creates the unity between theory and practice, which is praxis, uh, in order to basically fight against oppression, in order to fight against against that. And if you agree with the, if you agree with uh, majority of the things I say here and the things that is basically being espoused here, then I think. The the International Socialist Tendency will be a right organization for you. That, as well as the Committee for Revolutionary International Regroupment. That is another organization, uh, international organization, that is good. And I'm not even talking about basically protests or revolutionary situations just fighting against the United States. This is something that has to happen on the international whole, and as workers and marginalized people all around the world have to be able to stand in solidarity against the oppressive uh, state of the United States of America and any other oppressive state uh, under capitalism as a whole, because capitalism as a mode of production allows this kind of oppression and repression to happen in the first place. Join an organization, get organized, be able to fight against this, and, and it's our time to be able to overthrow these bureaucracies and capitalism as a whole and establish a true democratic society and even a society based off freedom and based off freedom and individual expression through collective compassion, uh, which, which is a free association. And that society is socialism and communism. Thank you guys for so much for watching. If you like this video, hit the like button down below. Uh, if you um, are new to my channel, hit the subscribe button. I would very much appreciate that. And yeah, uh, thank you for watching this video. I really appreciate it. And um, yeah, thank you all. Uh, it's been nice talking with you guys. Uh, bye. Oh, and check out other videos on the right and the left as well if you want to uh, uh, watch any more, as well as watch the other videos previously uh, to this one, so that way you can basically get caught up with the entire series as a whole, uh, and talk, and so that way we can know about like these uh, how the United States has basically declared war on the marginalized, as well as more for their uh, historical context. Uh, thank you guys for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed, and uh, yeah, socialist links is out.